Hello class, this is Fire Service Hydraulics and Water Supply, Chapter 3, Water in Motion, also known as Hydrokinetics. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand the characteristics and physical properties of water in motion and how it applies to fire professionals. One of the objectives we're going to cover in this class is the following. This is Objective 1, and we will explain how the principles of kinetic energy relate to the use of water in firefighting describe the principles of pressure along with that, and describe the four principles of fiction loss, and then eventually we will explain how the darcy Wiesbach formula and Hazen-Williams equation are used to determine friction loss in piping systems. For now, we're gonna start with objective one, which, was, which is we will explain how the principles of kinetic energy relate to the use of water in firefighting. Once water is set in motion, its velocity creates kinetic energy. Even when water is moving, some potential energy may still exist. Kinetic energy exerted by a moving body of water is the same as work being done. Here's a formula you need to be aware of. Given Ke stands for kinetic energy, G stands for work, M stands for mass of water, and lowercase v stands for velocity of the water. So this formula you need to be aware of, it is in your text. It is labeled in your text as equation 3.1 alpha. And the formula is Ke kinetic energy equals work equals mass of water times velocity squared divided by two. This is the formula that's used when gravity is causing the movement or acceleration of water, where water is W is the weight of the particle and this formula is most commonly used to represent kinetic energy of water. It's an alternative version of equation 3.1 that we just reviewed and can be developed when gravity is causing the movement or acceleration of water and it's M equals W over G. Let's talk about conservation of energy. Energy in a hydraulic system can either be created nor destroyed. It simply changes back and forth or changes forms back and forth between potential and kinetic energy. Total energy equals potential energy plus kinetic energy, therefore, and this is the principle of conservation of energy. Total energy within a system will remain constant. This is the formula, total energy equals potential energy plus kinetic energy. So total energy at any point in a system is equal to the sum of potential energy and the kinetic energy at that point. Energy in a hydraulic system can either be neither be created or destroyed. As we mentioned, it simply changes forms back and forth. So total energy remains constant, and any change in potential energy must be matched by corresponding change in kinetic energy. Why? Because kinetic energy and potential energy added together equal total energy. Let's discuss Bernoulli's theorem which is a form of the principle of conservation of energy that applies to the flow of an incompressible fluid moving through a hydraulic system. If you recall from the previous chapter, we discussed how water is the most common and advantageous tool for firefighting because it is incompressible. And the theorem states that in a steady flow without friction, the sum of velocity head, pressure head, and elevation head is constant for any incompressible fluid particle through its course. This does not reflect real world conditions because real life hydraulic systems experience pressure losses due to friction and other factors. In a steady flow without friction, the sum of the velocity head, pressure head, and elevation head is constant for any incompressible fluid particle throughout its course. Total pressure is at the same at any point within the system, important from a scientific standpoint, but does not reflect real world conditions. Real life hydraulic systems experience pressure losses due to friction and other factors. It can be applied to real life conditions using Bernoulli's equation. This is Bernoulli's equation. I'm not going to read it off to you, but this is it. It's in your text. And remember that the givens are H is head in feet, P is pressure in feet of head, W is specific weight of the fluid, which is 62.4 pounds per foot cubed for water. G is the acceleration of gravity, and V is the velocity in feet of head. 
This is the second formula, which is 3.3b, and this is in your text. And in this one, we have a little bit of different set of variables. Here, lowercase h sub 1.2 is loss head between points 1 and 2 in feet. P is pressure in feet of head. W is specific weight of the fluid, again at 62.4 pounds foot cubed for water. G is the acceleration of gravity, which is 32.2 feet per second squared. V is velocity in feet of head. And Z, lowercase 2, is head in feet. The difference in these two equations is that the components of potential energy attributed to elevation are represented by H in equation 3.3a and by Z in equation 3.3b. When applying the equation to water systems, the P slash W may be replaced by 2.31 times P for water as substantiated below. You need to look at this formula and make sure you work it out. It's explained in more detail in your text. And it is important to know that in this case, capital P is given in pounds per square inch, or PSI, and in units from resulting that are resulting from multiplying 2.31 times P are simply feet. Every term in Bernoulli's equation must have the same units, which are feet of head. Here you can see an application of Bernoulli's equation. And despite changes in piping between point 1 and 2, total energy at each point is the same. And you can see that denoted at the, denoted at the top, which is Te1 equals Te2. Total energy 1 equals total energy 2. OK, class. Let's take what we've learned so far using Bernoulli's equation and let's apply it to this problem. So you look at the pipe we have here. If the pressure gauge at the first point reads 70 PSI and the gauge at the second point reads 40 PSI, what is the water velocity at the second point if the velocity at point one is 15 feet per second? All right, so let's take what we've learned in chapter two on page 19 and 20 and apply Bernoulli's principle number three to solve this equation. Okay, class, let's solve the equation or the problem using Bernoulli's equation plus what we learned in chapter two on pages 19 and 20, and we'll apply Bernoulli's principle number three, plus we'll take what we learned at the beginning of this chapter to solve the equation. So the solution to the problem is we'll, is we'll use the equation that was introduced at the beginning of this chapter. 2.31 times the pressure at point one plus the velocity at point one squared divided by two times, okay, the acceleration of gravity plus the lost head between points one and two. Okay, and that's going to equal 2.31 times the pressure at point two plus the velocity at point two squared divided, okay, by the acceleration of gravity plus, okay, the lost head between points one and two in feet. So in this case, when you looked at the problem, you're going to notice that H1 and H2 are the same because there's no change in elevation. Thus, using algebra, we can synthesize Bernoulli's equation as follows. We take 2.31 times the difference between the pressure at point one and the pressure at point two. We add that to the velocity at point one squared divided by two times the acceleration of gravity. And that's gonna give us the velocity at point two squared divided by two times the acceleration of gravity. And if you remember correctly, the acceleration of gravity is 32.2 feet per second. All right, simplifying the equation even more, because if we're gonna solve for V2, we've gotta get V2 all by itself. So then we rewrite the equation as 2.31 times two times the acceleration of gravity times the difference between point one and point two plus, okay, here's the mistake. We're not going to multiply V1, okay, and square it. We're going to add 
the pressure at V1 and then square it. All right, in order to solve for V2, again, we've got to take the square root of everything. So V2, okay, will be equal to the square root of 2.31 feet per square inch times 64.4 feet per second. And we got that by taking the 32.2 feet per second and doubling it because we multiplied it by two. And then times the difference of the pressure at point one and point two, which is 70 minus 40, plus we're gonna take the pressure at V1 and square it, and that'll give us 225 feet per second. Okay, finally, working out the problem even more, we're gonna take V2 and we're going to multiply that times the square root of 2.31 feet per square inch times 64.4 feet per second times 30 pounds per square inches plus 15 squared, which is 225 feet per second. You're going to take the square root of all that, and that comes out to 68.4 feet per second. So the answer to the problem is the velocity at point two is 68.4 feet per second. If you need to read up on this a little bit more, you can go to page 26 and 27, 28 and 29 in your textbook. Let's discuss conservation of matter. The principle of conservation of matter states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. What goes into one end of piping or host system must come out the other. It also mentions, or applies rather, that when solid fuel burns, some of the byproducts of combustion, such as ash, smoke, etc., will equal the mass of the original fuel. And basically, when it comes to hydraulics, always remember what goes into one end of the piping hose system must come out the other. Let's talk about flow of liquid through a conduit, and it may be determined by Q equals A times V given that Q is some units of volume per unit of time, usually cubic feet per second or gallons per minute. A is the cross-sectional area of the conduit in square feet or feet squared, and V is the velocity of the stream in feet per second. Although whatever goes in one end of the system must come out the other, other variables may change. In for example, 750 gallons per minute are initially pumped into 5-inch hose line, and the hose is reduced to 4-inch. Area A, which is represented by A, and velocity, represented by V, of the stream will change. The area will decrease because you're going from 5-inch to 4-inch, but the velocity will increase. And here's where, they apply, where that's applied in a formula. If the water velocity in the five inch hose, okay, so the area or the diameter of the hose expressed in square feet would be 0 0.136, and that uh, has a velocity of 10 feet per second. What is the water velocity in a four inch hose if the diameter of the four inch hose, ex again, expressed in square feet, would be 0 0.087. So the question is, how many gallons per minute are flowing? So the solution to the problem would be we would take the area or the diameter of the five inch hose, which we said expressed in square feet would be 0 0.136 times the velocity, which is feet per second, and here it is 10, and that's going to equal the area of the four inch hose expressed in square feet, which is 0 0.087. And what we don't know is the velocity, okay, in the four inch line. So we're going to have to solve for V4. To do that, we've got to get V4 by itself. So this can be arranged to find Okay, V4 is follows. So we're going to uh, divide both sides of the equation by uh, 0 0.087, and then that's going to give us V4 equals 0 0.136 times 10 divided by 0 
0.087. And when we work that out, we find out that the velocity in the 4-inch line is 15 feet per second. Okay, so to determine the flow, you can use either the 4-inch or the 5-inch section of hose because Q5 is going to equal Q4. So Q is going to equal the diameter or the area of the 5-inch line times the velocity of the 5-inch line. So Q is going to equal uh, 0 0.136 per square foot times 10 feet per second. And that's going to equal uh, 1.36 per cubic foot per second. Now to convert this to gallons per minute, we're going to take 1.36 per cubic foot per second, multiply that times the, how much water is in a cubic foot, and it's 7.48 gallons. And we're going to multiply that times 60 seconds because uh, that's going to give us the GPM per minute. And when we take 1.36 per cubic foot times 7.48 gallons per cubic foot times 60 seconds, that's going to give us 610 gallons per minute. So it'll be 610 gallons will be going through this pipe. Principles of water flow in piping or hose systems is what we're going to discuss now. If the pipe or hose size remains constant, water velocity within a system will be constant. Principle two is within the same system, an increase in pipe or hose diameter will result in a reduction in water velocity. Principle three, within the same system, a reduction in pipe or hose size will result in an increase in water velocity. And principle four states that if a pipe or hose size within a system remains constant, water flowing uphill will travel with the same velocity as water flowing downhill. Here are a couple of important review questions. Remember, you will see these in upcoming quizzes and tests. First one is, how does kinetic energy differ from potential energy? You can see page 25 of the manual for the answer. And the second is, briefly explain the concept behind the principle of conservation of energy. And here you can review 26 and 27, pages 26 and 27 of your manual, manual for the answer. This next review question asks, if pipe or hose within a system remains constant, how will the velocity of water flowing uphill compare to water flowing downhill? You, for this, you can see page 31 in your manual for an answer. This learning objective two is about principles of pressure. We will describe principles of pressure and it's most commonly defined as force exerted on one substance by another. In the US customary or imperial system of measurement, pressure is expressed in unit pounds per square foot, PSF, or pounds per square inch, PSI. In the metric system, pressure is measured in kilopascals. Force is not pressure, simply a measure of weight, usually expressed in pounds and it's directly related to the force of gravity. If several objects of the same size and weight are placed on a flat surface, they each exert equal force on that surface. Now let's talk about force and pressure with US customary measurement. Three square containers of equal size, one by one by one, containing one cubic foot of water and weighing 64.2 pounds east, each are placed next to each other. Each container exerts a force of about 62.4 pounds per square foot with a total of 187.2 pounds of square foot over a three foot area. So you can see it illustrated in this picture. Now, if you take those same containers and they're stacked, the total force exerted 187.2 pounds is the same, but the area of contact is now reduced to one square foot. Pressure then becomes 187.2 pounds per square foot because you've got the downward force all exerted on the very low container and then concentrated in an area on that tabletop. Here's another example done in metric. If you have three square containers of equal size, one by one by one meters, containing one cubic meter of water and weighing a thousand kilograms each, if they're placed next to each other, the principle holds 
no matter what system of measurement you use. Each container exerts a force of about 1,000 kilograms per square meter with a total of about 3,000 kilograms of force over a three square meter area. Then if you take those same containers stacked, the total force exerted, 3,000 kilograms, remains the same, but the area of contact is reduced to one square meter. Pressure then becomes 3,000 kilograms per square meter. To understand how force is determined, you need to know the weight of water and the height of column that water occupies. 2.31 feet of water column exerts a pressure of 1 psi at its base. Because a 1 square foot contains 144 square inches, the weight of water in a 1 square inch column of water 1 foot high equals 62.4 pounds divided by 144 square inches or 0.433 pounds. A 1 square inch of column 1 foot high exerts a pressure at its base of 0.433 psi. The height required for 1 square inch column of water to produce 1 psi at its base equals 1 foot divided by 0.433 psi per foot or 2.31 feet. Therefore, 2.31 feet of water column exerts a pressure of 1 psi at its base. To determine this force in metric, a cube contains 100 columns of water, each 10 decimeters tall, so each column exerts 10 kilopascals at the base of the cube. Metric is easier because it's all based in tens, so it's a little bit easier to remember. So this is everything I just reviewed, explained here on this slide for you. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the atmosphere upon everything else on Earth. So you have gravity, which pulls from the Earth, and then the atmosphere that puts pressure. So pressure is highest at lower altitudes, like those below sea level, and lowest at very high altitudes, like on the tops of mountains. Above sea level, atmospheric pressure decreases about 0.5 psi, or 3.5 kilopascals for every 1,000 feet, or 300 meters. This may affect drafting above 2,000 feet or 600 meters. Readouts from most pressure gauges show pressure in addition to existing atmospheric pressure. To distinguish between gauge reading and actual atmospheric pressure, use pounds per square inch, kilopascals, and PSIA, kilopascals, A, for pounds per The most common method to measure atmospheric pressure is to compare the weight of atmosphere with the weight of a column of mercury and the greater the atmospheric pressure, the taller the column of mercury. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 2.95. If you have a column, 2.9 inches or 759 millimeters of mercury at sea level. At sea level, this column is 2.04 times 14.7 or 29.9 inches or 759 millimeters tall. So a pressure of 1 PSI or 6.89 kilopascals makes a column of mercury about 2.04 inches or 51.8 millimeters tall. Above sea level, atmospheric pressure decreases approximately 0.5 pounds per square inch or 3.5 kilopascals for every 1,000 feet or 300 meters. Above 2,000 feet or 600 meters, lower atmosphere pressure can be of concern. At high altitudes, fire pumps must work harder to produce pressures required for effective fire streams. So the pump's actually producing pressure that you would receive normally at a lower altitude. Readouts from most pressure gauges show pressure in addition to existing atmospheric pressure. To distinguish between a gauge reading actual atmospheric pressure, use PSIG for pounds per square inch gauge or PSIA KPAA for pounds per square inch absolute. So it's KPAA is kilopascals A or absolute. PSI or kilopascals above a perfect vacuum is absolute zero. Any pressure less than atmospheric pressure is called a vacuum. When a gauge reads negative five PSIG or negative 35 kilopascals, it indicates a 5 psi or 35 kilopascals less than existing atmospheric pressure. Absolute zero pressure is perfect vacuum, and that's actually what you find in space. Now, head pressure, head in feet may be converted to head pressure by dividing the number of feet by 2.31. 
The result is the number of feet that one PSI raises a column of water. Head refers to the height of water supply above the discharge orifice. Head in feet may convert to head pressure by dividing the number of feet by 2.31. The result is the number of feet that one PSI raises a column of water. And you see it illustrated here on this slide. In this scenario, if water supply were located 200 feet above the discharge opening, then head pressure would be 200 divided by 2.31 or 87 pounds per square inch, 87 PSI. In metrics, you divide the number of meters by 0.1 to get the head pressure in kilopascals. Let's discuss the presence of static pressure. Static pressure in water flow is stored potential energy that's available to force water through. That includes pipes, fittings, hoses, and adapters. So it's ever present throughout the line. The pressure on water system before water flows from the hydrant is called static pressure. So if you put the gauge on the pump or fire hydrant as they did here, you get a pressure reading, or you will get a pressure reading if there's water in the line. Because the water's not moving, it's under static pressure. Normal operating pressure is pressure found in water distribution system during normal consumption demands. The difference between the system's static pressure and normal operating pressure results from friction caused by water flowing through various pipes, valves, and fittings in the system. So the demand for water consumption fluctuates continuously. So if you're operating fire hydrant off of a grid, you've got to remember there are other homes and businesses that are drawing water from that same grid. Then you have residual pressure. That part of total available pressure that's not used to overcome friction loss or gravity while forcing water through the pipes, fittings, fire hoses, and adapters that's the normal operating pressure. So the difference between these two results from the friction, again, caused by water flowing through various pipes, valves, and fittings. No residual pressure means no water supply. The part of the total available pressure that's not used to overcome friction loss or gravity while forcing water through pipes, fittings, fire hose, and adapters is that residual pressure. But if you do not have any residual pressure, you do not have a water supply. So there's a residual pressure water flow test where you take a static pressure reading off of test hydrant, open one or more hydrants near the test hydrant and allow them to flow. This reduces pressure reading on the test hydrant and the lowered pressure is the residual pressure for that hydrant. Residual pressure varies according to the amount of water flowing from one or more hydrants, water consumption demands, and size of pipe. It must be identified by a test hydrant, not at a hydrant that's being flowed. What you're looking for is to see what the pressure is that's remaining in the system after you've engaged uh, another hydrant, which feeds off the same system. So obviously, if it goes to zero, you have no residual pressure. So that gives you an idea of where that measurement comes from and why it's done on a separate hydrant. Flow pressure is forward velocity pressure created at discharge opening while water is flowing. Using a pitot tube and gauge, velocity of flow pressure is measured and converted to PSI, pounds per square inch. If the size of the discharge opening is known, measurement of flow pressure can be used to calculate volume of water flowing in gallons per minute. So more review questions for you to look up and remember to uh, note that these are on future quizzes and tests. The first question is, what is the difference between pressure and force? You need to see page 31 of your manual for the answer to that. And the second question is, at what point can lower atmospheric pressure become a concern to firefighters? You can review that on page 33 of your, your textbook. A couple more questions. One is, if a water supply is 200 feet or 60 meters above the hydrant discharge opening that it supplies, what is the head pressure? You can see the answer for this on page 34. And what causes the difference between a system's static pressure and its normal operating pressure? That you can review on page 36 of the manual. A couple of more questions. Where should residual pressure be identified? You can review that on page 36 of your manual. And what can be used to measure the velocity of flow pressure? You can review that on page 36 of your text. Learning objective three, we will list and explain the four principles of friction loss. 
Friction loss is caused by movement of water molecules against each other, against the inside lining of fire hose or inside a pipe, inside couplings, through sharp bends, or changes in hose, pipe, or orifice sizes by adapters or improperly sized gaskets. So friction is created by hose linings, appliances, and other parts of the system that will reduce pressure at the discharge end of the system. Friction loss is the part of total pressure lost while forced water is going through pipes, fittings, fire hoses, and adapters. This slide is a little bit redundant, but basically remember that anything that affects water movement may cause additional friction loss. The smoother the inside of a hose or pipe, the less friction loss you have. Good quality fire hose has smooth inner surfaces and causes less friction loss than lower quality hose. Friction loss in old hose may be as much as 50% greater than that in new hose. Given that all other conditions are the same, the amount of friction loss is directly proportional to the length of hose or pipe. Given the same flow, the longer the hose or pipe is, the more friction loss there will be in the system. One example of the first principle of friction loss is one 2 inch, half inch, or 65 millimeter hose line that is 100 feet or 30 meters long. Another is a 2.5 inch, 65 millimeter hose line that is 200 feet or 60 meters long. You can see that because one is longer than the other, you're going to have ultimately more friction loss in the second. If a constant flow of 200 gallons per minute or 800 liters per minute is maintained in each hose, the 100 foot hose will have friction loss of 8 psi and the 200 foot hose line will have a friction loss of 16 psi. As I just mentioned, that longer hose has got more opportunity for friction loss and therefore it has more friction loss. The second principle of friction loss states that when hoses or pipes are the same size, friction loss varies approximately within the square of increase in velocity of flow. Friction loss not only increases as flow velocity increases, but at a much higher rate. One example is 200 foot or 60 meter, two and a half inch or 65 millimeter hose line. If you have a flow of 200 gallons per minute, your friction loss is 16 psi or 112 kilopascals. The flow of 400 gallons per minute or 600 liters per minute is a friction loss of 64 psi or 448 kilopascals. A flow of 600 gallons per minute or 2400 liters per minute is a friction loss of 144 psi or 1008 kilopascals nine times the loss at 200 gallons per minute. The third fr principle of friction loss is that friction loss varies inversely as the fifth power of the diameter of the hose, so that given the same flow, the larger the hose is, the less friction will occur. To illustrate this mathematically, consider a 4 inch or 100 millimeter and 5 inch or 125 millimeter supply hose. If you Calculate one over the other, you have a difference of 0.328. Given the same flow, 5 inch or 125 millimeter hose will have approximately 33% as much friction loss as 4 inch or 100 millimeter hose. The fourth principle of friction loss states that for a given flow velocity, friction loss is approximately the same regardless of the pressure on the water. Friction loss is the same when hose lines or pipes at different pressures flow the same amount of water. The same volume of water pumped into a hose or pipe under pressure at one end will be discharged at the other end. This explains why friction loss is the same when hose lines or pipes at different pressures flow the same amount of water. If a 100 gallon per minute or 400 liter per minute passes through 3 inch or 77 millimeter hose line within a certain time, the water must travel at a specified velocity in feet or meters per second, and for the same rate of flow to pass through one and a half inch or 38 millimeter hose line, velocity must be greatly increased. Four one and a half inch or 38 millimeter hose lines are needed to flow 100 gallons per minute or 400 liters per minute at the same velocity as a single three inch or 77 millimeter line. Because water is practically incompressible, the same volume of water pumped into a hose or pipe under pressure at one end will be discharged at the other. The size of the hose or pipe determines the velocity at which the volume of water will be discharged. The smaller the hose, the greater the velocity need needed to deliver the same volume. Fire hoses that expand to a larger inside diameter under higher pressure will decrease velocity and friction loss. 
flow pressure will be greatest near the supply source and lowest at its farthest point. You can see that illustrated in this slide. Okay, some review questions for you to make sure you remember to look up and use for future events. The first is list at three ways, at least three ways, friction loss can happen. This is on page 36 and 37 of your manual. Given the same flow, how will a longer hose or pipe affect friction loss in a system? For that, you need to page 37 of your manual. The next review question, what happens to friction loss as flow velocity increases? See page 37 of your text for this example question, or for this question rather. Learning objective four, we will explain how the darcy wiesbach formula and Hayes and Williams equation are used to determine friction loss in piping system. Determining friction loss system in piping systems means that most hydraulic calculations covered here will involve determining pressure loss and necessary pump discharge pressures in various layouts of fire hoses. Other applications within the broader fire protection field remind, require similar calculations. Most calculation programs tend to be based on the Darcy Wiesbach formula and Hazen Williams formula. Most fire service professionals will never have occasion to use these formulas, but you need to be aware of them as you may encounter others who do use them in their work. The Darcy Wiesbach formula is the more accurate of the two formulas. It's mostly wide, most widely used by the engineering profession, but not fire protection, but it is recommended for testing foam proportioning systems. This is the Darcy Wiesbach formula, and it's H lowercase f equals f times v squared times L divided by 2 times g times uppercase D. And the givens are that HF is head loss due to friction in feet or meters. F is a dimensionless friction factor. L is pipe length in feet or meters. V is fluid velocity in feet per second or meters per second. D is pipe diameter in feet or meters. And G is acceleration due to gravity, which is 32.2 feet per second squared or 9.81 meters per second squared. Friction factor depends on whether flow of water through the pipes is laminar or turbulent. The Reynolds number helps determine which flow is present. Here is the Reynolds number. The equation is R sub E equals velocity times D or diameter in feet divided by viscosity, kinematic viscosity. So in this formula, the given factors are R sub case E, which is the Reynolds number, and V is fluid velocity in feet per second, D is diameter in feet of the pipe, and the velocity symbol or viscosity symbol is kinematic viscosity of the fluid in feet squared per second. This is on page or table 3.1 in your chapter. Please make sure you reference that and read about it. The Reynolds number here is table 3.1. It shows you all of these pre-calculated using that formula that we just read. Make sure you become familiar with this table and know where to reference it when you need it. And this is the same thing done um, for another fuller set of numbers. Reynolds number means the point at which laminar flow becomes turbulent is the Reynolds number itself. Most fire protection circles recognize the Reynolds number to 100 as the transition point from laminar flow to turbulent flow. The laminar flow is rare in a fire protection setting. The fire protection industry uses the Hazen Williams formula more commonly than the Darcy Wiesbach formula. NFPA Standard 13 and Standard 24 require use of the Hazen Williams formula in hydraulic friction loss calculations. The result may not be quite as accurate as the Darcy Wiesbach formula, but it is generally easier to understand and use. Here's the Hayes and Williams formula, and in this formula, you, here are the given values. V is water velocity in feet per second. R is the hydraulic radius in inches. S is the slope of the hydraulic gradient in feet of head loss per foot of pipe. And C is the Hayes and Williams coefficient of roughness. This Hayes and Williams formula allows us to calculate water velocity given in specified head loss. It is of little practical use from a fire protection engineering standpoint.
this more theoretical tool where we develop our practice standards from. So that's why it's important to know. Fire protection professionals are interested in determining friction loss in pipe when the pipe's size and the roughness and flow in gallons per minute are known in the fire protection version. Equation 3.8 at the bottom of page 41 in your textbook allows us to calculate the water velocity given a specified head loss. However, that information is of little practical use from a fire protection engineering standpoint. For fire protection professionals are more interested in determining the friction loss in a pipe when the pipe size and roughness and the flow in gallons per minute are known. To accomplish this, the original formula can be revised, changing the water velocity in feet per second to gallons per minute and feet of head to pounds per square inch. This yields the more commonly used fire protection version found at the top of page 42 in your textbook, and it's on your screen now here in slide 3-85, where you have PF, which is the pressure loss to friction in pounds per square inch per foot of pipe, equals uh, 4.52 times the flow rate in gallons per minute raised to the 1.8 fifth power divided by C, which is the Hayes and Williams coefficient of roughness found in table 3.2 here in your textbook to raise to the 1.8 power times D, which is the internal pipe diameter in inches raised to the 4.87 power. Before we begin to calculate some sample problems, a simple examination of the Hayes and William formula will provide some important facts concerning friction loss. The flow Q is raised to the 1.8 fifth power in the equation. Thus, when the flow rate is doubled, if all other things remain constant, the friction loss will be about four times greater. If the flow triples, the friction loss will almost be nine times greater. This is similar to the concepts of the second principle of friction loss. The pipe diameter is raised to the 4.87 power in the denominator of the equation. Thus, any increase in pipe size will reduce friction loss if all other factors remain the same. If the diameter is doubled, the friction loss will be reduced by a factor close to 1 32nd. If the diameter is tripled, the friction loss will be about 1 243rds of its original value. Thus, pipe diameter is the single variable with the greatest impact on friction loss. The actual internal diameter of any given pipe will differ slightly from the nominal size of the pipe. For example, Schedule 40 steel 6 inch above ground pipe will have an actual internal diameter of 6.065 inches. Using the actual internal diameter of the pipe is important to achieving accurate results with the Hayes and Williams formula. Make sure you refer to tables 3.3 and 3.4 on page 44. They list the nominal and actual internal diameters for various common pipe sizes and materials. The coefficient of roughness, which is C, is a reflection of the interior surface condition of the pipe. Large values of C would indicate smooth pipe and thus less friction loss. Smaller values of C reflect rough or deteriorating pipe, which in turn will have greater friction loss. Refer to table 3.3 for sample values of C in commonly encountered types of pipe. Table 3.3 .3 is located at the bottom of page 43 in your textbook. This is table 3.2, which is the kinematic viscosity of certain liquids. And it's been pre-calculated out. So you need to make sure that you read this table, determine how they calculated these values, and know where it is when you need to reference it. This is an example of the Hayes and Williams formula in the metric form where PF, which is the head loss per unit of pipe, okay, equals 10.67 times the flow rate raised to the 1.8 fifth power divided by C, which is the Hazel 
Williams coefficient of, written, of roughness raised to the 1.8 fifth power times the internal pipe diameter in meters raised to the 4.86 fifth, fifth power. Given that PF is the pressure loss to friction in PSI per feet of square pipe, oh, excuse me, of pipe, Q is the flow rate in gallons per minute. The flow or Q is raised to 1.85 power. When the flow rate is doubled, friction loss will be about four times greater. The pipe diameter is raised to 4.87 power in the denominator, denominator, which means that any increase in pipe size will reduce friction loss if all other factors remain the same. And the pipe diameter is a single variable with the greatest impact on friction loss. Here is the nominal and actual internal diameters above ground piping. So they've taken the standard piping that you see for above ground and use the Hayes and Williams formula to pro, um, process out these values. And you need to know this table, be familiar with it, figure out how they came to these values. So you are exercising your ability to use the formula correctly and then make sure you remember where to reference this table when you need it. The coefficient of roughness with the value of uppercase C is a reflection of interior surface condition of the pipe. The large values of C indicate smooth pipe and less friction loss. Smaller values of C reflect rough or deteriorating pipe, which will in turn have greater friction loss. This is table 3.3, which values of C as recommended by NFPA standard 24. So you definitely need to be familiar with this table and know where to reference it and when to reference it. And it shows you the coefficient factor from everything from unlined cast iron to pipes or hose with polyvinyl chloride, PVC lining type of pipe. An example of the Hayes and Williams formula in action is example question. How much pressure is lost to friction as 1,250 gallons per minute travel through 800 feet of 6 inch schedule 40 steel pipe having a coefficient of 100? So if you plug in these values into the formula with, that we used or identified the ask values of earlier, then the total loss over the 800 feet length is 59.2 PSI. This is a good exercise for you to do and make sure you use the values as denoted when we reviewed the formula and plug in the values and you should get exactly the same answer. In metric, this is an application. How much pressure is lost to friction as 5,000 liters per minute travel through 240 meters of 154 millimeter schedule 40 steel pipe having a coefficient value of 100? Again, they just plugged in the given values, plug in the numbers, and for the metric answer, you come up with 127 kilopascals. That's the total loss over 240 meter length of pipe. Review questions. These you need to make sure you're aware of for quizzes and future tests. Also, they are a prompt for you to go back and review important things in the chapter. The first question is, which single variable has the greatest impact on friction loss? That is available on page 43 of your manual. Second question, what does a large value of the coefficient of reference to represent? For that, you need to see page 43 of your manual. As always, if you need any further review and or help with anything in this chapter, please make sure to contact your instructor. Thank you as always for your time. See you again when we meet for chapter four.